Well, my name's Doug Ford. Uh, I've set up a company called Doug Ford Analog Design, which oddly enough does analog electronics design. I guess I started off in electronics as a very, very, very young lad, probably uh, pre-school. I was interested in electricity. And bear in mind we're looking at the uh, uh, early 60s here. Anything related to electricity, science, uh, physical principles, and the tricks that you could do with these, you know, how you could light up a light bulb, you know, how you could make an electromagnet. If we're talking about early primary school, it was these little things, just how stuff worked. And of course, I was really, really good at that time at taking apart clocks. Not so flashy getting them back together, but anything that had that electrical or mechanical association had me fascinated. How did it work? What made it tick? And uh, I think think that even these days anybody who has that fascination that why does it work what makes it work what makes it tick uh, they're going to have a natural interest that'll see them good right through into their working career that interest just stayed with me for life so right through primary school particularly uh, during high school color tv was coming to australia everybody was tossing out their black and white tv sets so on every roadside there were TVs to be had by the score to pick up and rat for components. So uh, uh, particularly in those early high school years I was making a lot of incredibly bad valve amplifiers using leftover bits out of TVs. Uh, not for sale, purely for hobby. It's so difficult these days for somebody to open up a product and say, ah, that's how it works they're impenetrable. You open up a product and it's a PCB full of completely cryptic little black boxes soldered onto a green circuit board and there's very little that you can do. Back in the day of course you'd open up a TV and there are lots and lots of discrete components and you could identify what each one was and what it did. Same as uh, I guess you open up a clock. You could identify what, what role each cog plays in a clock. Uh, that's no longer true, so it's pretty hard to capture somebody's interest when they're young in how does this stuff work. I was a voracious reader. My parents helped, helped me with uh, uh, buying, even at quite a young age, five and six and seven, little how do things work type books. Light electricity and magnetism, for example, is one. Uh, how weather works was another one and these were dumbed down to the level that a five or a six or a seven year old could understand and they were great. I started reading a local electronics magazine. Uh, at that time it was Electronics Australia and even though I didn't understand 95% of what was in the magazine, over a period of time through osmosis I was able to join dots and build up my picture of how stuff worked and how the universe worked. Uh, again, we're talking a pretty young age here. Go a bit further down the track and of course you've got uh, your later high school years where you're picking up the maths and the physics to understand more of how the world works and how the gubbins in that particular widget works. But most of it, particularly the early years, was reading books, magazines. Anybody who was interested in uh, electronics or electricity was a nerd or a geek. Uh, there was, uh, there were definitely clubs for uh, radio operators, for example, and for quite a period as a teen, uh, I was associated with uh, the local amateur radio group. I think that that was where most of the electronics enthusiasts tended to band up at the time. At high school, there were a few like-minded chaps and we tended to cluster together and discuss the witchiness of the why. Uh, but no, in general, uh, particularly down in uh, a South Coast coal mining district, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of interest in how stuff worked. I guess I was mostly into the audio side of things, uh, uh, fledgling guitarist trying to make my own guitar amplifiers and uh, play, uh, also just trying to come up with decent uh, hi-fi systems which were louder than everybody else's. Uh, some of my other mates though were right into the amateur radio side of things. 
So they were more interested in building uh, ever more grandiose antennas. Some of them were, well actually we, we all played around with building little one and two and three valve transmitters, uh, <laughs> AM transmitters, and we were successfully able to communicate uh, between suburbs down on the coast. I don't know whose services we were interfering with, but that didn't concern us at the time. Uh, so it was a mixed bag of uh, audio versus radio almost. Although the, uh, if you like, the book learning uh, allowed me to understand why it's mucking about on the test bench with a hot soldering iron or twisting wires together. It's the doing that stood me in good stead later. It allowed me to uh, reaffirm what things work, what techniques don't work. Mucking about on the on the test bench, or at that stage it was the kitchen table, uh, that was invaluable. So yeah, uh, you, you're right, I hadn't really thought thought about that side of it, but just doing experiments, manipulating components, so tacking circuits together and seeing if the buggers worked, that was very, very important. Uh, down on the coast, we had our favorite uh, disposal store. It was basically a junkyard run by a fellow called Cavian, and you could get uh, secondhand and surplus anything and everything there and we basically made pests of ourselves haunting the place looking for interesting stuff to pick up and take home. At the stage I was starting out, retail electronics shops did not exist. There was no such thing. You either had your disposals and surplus stores or you had your local radio TV repairman who might sell you the odd brand new capacitor or brand new resistor if you were really desperately stuck and wanted to pay 50 times what you'd pay down at the junkyard. There were no retail shops. Actually, I think that one of the first electronics shops in Wollongong was uh, Tandy and they were dreadfully disappointing. Uh, I bought a couple of loudspeakers from Tandy at the time they were rated at 50 watts or whatever, and we put 10 watts into them and they fell over and died and the smoke came out. So we had one or two experiences there and just didn't go back. Uh, that was probably our, our first experience, all of our group, with retail electronics and it was a disappointing one. I guess I was accustomed to ratting through my huge by then stores, you know, bucket loads of discrete resistors to pick out the one that I wanted at the time. Uh, I guess it was that process, writ large and hung on pegboards on the wall. There was an electronics kit, which really was, again, seminal in assisting my understanding. Uh, it predates the Funway stuff by a good 10 or 15 years, and it was put out by Philips. It was called the Philips Electronics Engineer Kit. I wonder how many people in Australia remember those. Uh, basically a pegboard, uh, paper patterns that you could put on the, on the breadboard, on the pegboard, sorry pins that you could stick up through and you would then wire the discrete components from pin to pin according to the paper mud map which was over the pegboard. And uh, again that probably assisted radically with uh, not just component identification but because the paper mud maps were laid out as the circuit diagram was laid out it immediately formed this mental relationship between the circuit diagram, the paper representation, and the hardware sitting on your pegboard. That was magic. Uh, that kit stood me in good stead for a good five or six years. Needless to say, went through uh, high school, university, degree. I took on an apprenticeship at Lysarts, which lasted three weeks. Now, at that time, uh, even holiday work, uh, there was a lot of industry in Wollongong, the steelworks were going great guns. Uh, I had several holiday jobs at the steelworks down there, earning, Yeah, you know, I was a spotty faced kid earning adult wages, including overtime, etc. Great days. Uh, that ended probably five to seven years later, uh, and the steelworks really did wind down. But at that time, it was, you know, the heyday for uh, the steelworks. So getting an apprenticeship at that time, uh, we're talking 74, 75, just not a problem. Uh, I don't know where you would go about getting an apprenticeship these days. 
back once again when I was a teenager, there were a few large manufacturers, uh, such as Pi, for example. Uh, does anybody remember Pi as a brand? They had a big factory in Coral. Uh, there are uh, a few other brands like uh, you know, HMV, etc. Thorne, I believe, also had uh, big plants in Australia. I think the day of the big uh, brand name manufacturer is gone. What you have now is of a different nature. You have design houses, you have assembly houses, and then you have uh, cardboard box, cardboard, cardboard box in, cardboard box out, uh, retail networks. There are a lot of people out there who've got some really good IP, but they don't manufacture. They farm their manufacturing out. I've worked for a variety of companies, but uh, I guess the company with which I was the longest time was a local company called Jans Electronics. Uh, Jans, at the stage I was with them, manufactured pretty much everything related to putting on a rock show or a stage performance. So the audio power amplifiers, the mixing consoles, <coughs> uh, speakers, uh, lighting dimmers, lighting control consoles, and a whole plethora of little odd jobs. And I was with Jans for in total about 19 years. And they were, that was I think a great place to get a grounding in a whole bunch of technologies all related to uh, sound and lighting. Uh, from there, I went to Rode Microphones for, uh, I was with them for 18 months, uh, designing studio condenser microphones. I guess engineering at Rode Microphones was a bit different to what I'd been doing at Jans. Rode Microphones were pretty much a one product company without this huge uh, diverse range. At no stage did I ever receive a written product brief it was more a waving of the hands in the air and can you design me a microphone that's kind of like that but really really low noise and doesn't make noises when you shake it. Ah, uh, okay. So although the goals were self-determined the process was uh, pretty much a, a case of yeah sit down try a few different circuit topologies see which one showed the most promise okay oh beauty I'm getting good results out of that one let's chase down some optimized components for that one and let's get the PCB designed so that uh, it's more immune to induced noise. I guess engineering at Rode Microphones was a little bit chaotic for a number of reasons, but it was always targeted. You know, I knew what the end result had to be. And sometimes the paths that we took to it were uh, a little bit diverse and diffuse. For example, one of the uh, parameters was, okay, the microphone, when you, you know, tap the microphone stand, should not conduct sound up to the microphone capsule. Well, we came up with a marvellous rubbery suspension system for the microphone capsule. Had a little problem, though. When you tap the microphone stand, the capsule would go wubble, 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 dreadfully underdamped. How do we damp this movement yet still get good sound isolation? Well, I came up with this little cone of blue tack that just touched the top of the microphone capsule and it was just enough to damp the movement so that it would go woof, woof, critically damped. How do we do that in production? Well, we had no idea what kind of material we could actually use in production to achieve this until one of the women at Rode Microphones came up with a clever idea, which was the same foamy stuff that you use for ear protectors. And that's the material that, to my, the best of my knowledge, is used to this date. Some of this is electronic engineering. Some of it's mechanical, physical, acoustic engineering. Uh, at the stage that I was there, which was in 2000, 2001, uh, there were about 35 or 40 people there. Uh, most of them were uh, female assembly operators. In R&D, there was simply me doing the electronics and another chap, Stuart, 
who was doing the CAD work for the mechanical design of the housings. The style of the microphones was primarily dictated by the CEO. So between the pair of us, we'd sit down, we'd nut out a couple of ideas, Stuart would CAD them up, uh, texture them and print them out. You can have A, B, C or D. Oh yeah, C looks good, we'll have that one. And we would then turn that into a product. I, while I was there, I came up with what I think are some particularly innovative electronic circuits for those. I wasn't so much involved in the transducer design, but uh, certainly the product testing and the electronics. Uh, I'm particularly proud of what I did there. The very first one was the Classic 2. Uh, it's a valve microphone that uh, people were later horrified to discover that I had incorporated a transistor in a valve microphone. Oh, this, this was a heinous crime apparently, but uh, uh, nonetheless I was able to... Uh, that, that, was the, that was the very first product that I designed with them. Uh, shortly after that was the NT3, which is a little uh, pencil microphone, both battery and fan of power. Uh, after that was the NT1000 and what I reckon is my uh, crowning achievement, uh, the NTK microphone. Now the NTK is also a valve microphone which incorporates some semiconductors. It's got really low noise for a valve microphone, remarkably low noise, I think it's down about 12 dB. Uh, but the headroom on the thing is just frightening. Uh, the total dynamic range from memory exceeded 140 dB and the main reason for that is it's capable of outputting up to about 35 volts RMS. Uh, there's not many microphones that are capable of outputting 35 volts RMS so I'm pretty proud of that one. I think that Rode are a marvellous high profile example because microphones are a relatively high profile product but uh, there are so many uh, lower profile products. Uh, th think about GMC radios, for example. Uh, I don't know too much about them, but I think that they're another example of a little Aussie company that's grown and grown and grown, and they're making some marvellous world-class products.